The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, folks, depending on where you're logging in from. That all sounds just about right. Thanks for joining us this week. We've got a, a great agenda for you today. We're going to talk through um, basics of arbitration processes and um, uh, so much more. So before we get going, love to hear where everyone's logging in from. We've got about uh, three minutes left till showtime. Um, we've got uh, uh, myself, Don Cook. I'm here in uh, Cleveland. Um, Kelsey Rizzuto is with us today. Uh, Kelsey's new to the team. She's been here for about, what, Kelsey, a month now? Yeah, I think five weeks. So, yeah. Five weeks. Five weeks. Moving on up. She's uh, she's here in the office, though we're significantly social distance. Um, and uh, Jim Vada is in Cincinnati today, working at yeah. the home office. We're we're two hundred miles of social distance apart. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, all right, we got uh, Stephen from uh, Yardley, PA, from Bucks County. Now, uh, let me know, um, Stephen, where you went to high school. I went to Ridley, uh, which is right around the corner from there. Um, so very interesting. Welcome. Uh, we've got John from the home office just outside of Canterbury, England. Welcome, John. Andrew from uh, Valspan, Texas. Welcome, Andrew. Jeff, familiar name. I think uh, one of our winners from last week, if I'm not mistaken, Kelsey, which you're going to talk about here in a few minutes. Um, down the street in Ohio. Uh, let's see. Oh, where are uh, where are friends from British Columbia? They're always right yeah. on top of things. <laughs> Olivia, and man, he jumped down to one, two, three, four, five. He's oh, he's the draw. Yeah, okay, I see him now. <laughs> he's here working out of the home office. Uh, Russell in uh, Columbia, Missouri. He says he's back. <laughs> Funny. Uh, right on. Uh, thanks for sharing that stuff, everybody. If you guys want to keep those comments, I'll catch up um, once we get to the Q and A section. Um, love hearing where everyone's coming in from. So I think the furthest away we've got so far is Canterbury, uh, UK. So it's holding the prize right now. I guess we don't have any prizes though for farthest away. Maybe we should consider that. I gotta, I gotta work on my budget here. Uh, Doug in San Antonio, um, Alan in Santa Barbara. Right on. I've got 11 o'clock on the nose. So why don't we get going? So. Great topic for you guys today around the basics of arbitration um, processing and um, a lot more. Jim is gonna, has got a, a lot to go through today, so I'm going to try and speed things up here on the front end. Uh, a couple of quick hitters that we discuss each week. Um, our webinars are designed for CWNP, Continuing Education Credits, so please take advantage uh, if you need a certificate for attending a webinar. Uh, even if you need to go back in time, I can certainly um, get some certificates for you. So just shoot me an email. I'm happy to do that. We won't get into any of the products today, um, and we never do on these weekly demos, or excuse me, weekly webinars. If you want a product tour, you can go to go.7signal.com forward slash tour, and um, we'll go through the, the different products. There's no sales reps on the line. It's just me and Eric Camuli, our head of customer success, and we just walk through the products. You can get uh, access to all of our archived webinars on our YouTube channel, and you can get our slides on our Twitter. Uh, so please follow us. And uh, we will be at Wi-Fi now this year, um, like we were last year, but this year is a virtual event. So we'll share the link to register for Wi-Fi now here shortly. Um, so you all can can join. It's a free registration this year, which is also different than last year. Um, and Kelsey is going to share last week's winners. We had uh, trivia winners and Twitter follower winners. Is that right, Kelsey? That is correct. Yeah. So our trivia winners from last week were Alex Durant, Jeff Kidd, and Doug Hinecki. And then our Twitter winners were Romani Fahim and Robert Ninsik. So like Don said, we post our slides every Wednesday right after the webinar. So follow us at 7Signal. And this week, I think what we're going to do is pick our first three followers as some possible winners of 7Signal swag. All right. Thanks, Gelson. We've got a, a tough trivia question for you all today. So stay tuned for that. Um, so we're immortalizing the winners on these weekly webinars now. Uh, so just real quick, we, we do have a promotion going on uh, that we've been running through COVID. 
uh, for those of you struggling with uh, your work from home employees, uh, Seven Signals Mobileye can give you uh, visibility into those Wi-Fi networks um, at home so you can uh, troubleshoot and fix um, all the issues that they're having. We're hearing a lot around uh, enterprise applications failing in the home environment, so we can certainly help there. So a little bit about us before we get going here, Seven Signals started in 2007. Uh, we hit a lot of major milestones along the way. We're really proud of our 5 million devices that we're monitoring on a daily basis and over 200 uh, customer networks that we're on. Um, we're certified in over 40 countries around the world. We're GDPR compliant, so we're staying relevant, not only with our technology stack, but also with privacy concerns that you may have. Seven Signal does not pull any private data from your devices as we monitor. Um, we are here uh, to ensure a seamless digital experience for your end users. No one has created that perfect AP or that perfect device just yet. Uh, so you need monitoring in the background running to ensure a reliable connection and make sure that those applications are running the way they're supposed to. Our applications give our end users full visibility into their environments, uh, completely AP and device agnostic. And what we deliver is an outside-in approach, um, which I'll get to in, in just a minute. So what we're looking for are what we call the top seven Wi-Fi problems. These present themselves differently um, to the end user. So, you know, they're complaining about slow connectivity or no connectivity. Um, they never call you and say the Wi-Fi is blazing fast today and, and we don't need your help. Um, you're always getting those complaints. So what we're looking for is things like congestion and coverage problems, interference, roaming, looking at adapters and drivers, all the things that go into making up those seven problems. And how we're doing it is we're running active and passive tests on the network and on those devices for things like packet loss, latency and jitter, uh, looking at those adapters and drivers, as I mentioned, uh, looking at the spectrum analysis in your uh, enterprise environments, so if you're looking at it from a standard LAN infrastructure, um, you all have great uh, tools, uh, monitoring tools on your infrastructure right now from you know, AppNeta or SolarWinds or others living on the servers. What's, uh, and, and including your access points, right? Cisco and, and MIST and Aruba and others have, have great technologies for um, telling you what's going on in those environments. Seven Signal takes that outside in approach to understanding what's going on in your environment. Um, your um, uh, current tools tell you one thing, we look at it from the end user's perspective. Mobileye, for instance, lives on the device itself, your pickers, your scanners, your laptops, your phones, any Windows, Mac, or Android device. And Sapphire Eye, our sensor, uh, is monitoring that infrastructure from uh, the air. So giving you that service level quality and visibility into the RF that you cannot get from other solutions. <clears throat> so that extends through external networks as well. Uh, Jim and I always talk through um, the, you know, the enterprise view of things, but also uh, keep in mind that your home networks, your work from home employees, uh, we can see into their, their home environments and routers and see what's going on with the channels and, and interference. So um, some great visibility that you just can't get uh, without a mobile eye solution. So um, let's see, we've got one trivia question today, then we're gonna get into the meat and potatoes today with Jim Vada. So, uh, I'm going to launch this poll and read it out. So, uh, and we'll be able to go back in time here through, um, go to webinar and see who our winners are. Um, we'll give out swag just as we have before. So this is a true or false question. 80211 has centralized scheduling, true or false. So uh, Kelsey will go through just as she did last week and we'll, we'll pick out uh, three of the fastest correct answers and see how everybody does. So it looks like the results are slowly rolling in. Um, some changes, some changed answers perhaps. Uh, let me close this poll out and share. And uh, Jim, tricky one. How, how everybody did today. Very tricky one. So practically speaking, the answer is false. We, we don't use centralized scheduling uh, in, in Wi-Fi networks today. Uh, literally speaking, though, the 802.11 standard has uh, a centralized channel access me method called PCF. 
but that's never been put into practice. And then there is OFDMA in uh, Wi-Fi 6, which we'll touch on today, which actually combines some elements of centralized and distributed uh, channel access. So tough question. Jim always gives us the tough ones. Um, so Jim, <laughs> I'm going to make you the I'm going to make you the presenter, and uh, we'll go ahead and uh, get rolling with your end of the presentation. Sounds good. Let's see slideshow view. Okay, let's jump in. Uh, so very quickly about me, I am the director of global Wi-Fi solutions here at Seven Signal. I'm a CWNE and CCNP enterprise, uh, long experience as a wireless network engineer, uh, doing design, troubleshooting operations in several different verticals. You can follow me on Twitter at Jim Vada, and I have a blog um, exclusively about Wi-Fi on framebyframewifi.net. And my new amateur radio call sign is Kilo Echo 8 Oscar Kilo Victor on the ham bands. If you like me, you got uh, antsy uh, during the quarantine and we're looking for things to do, uh, getting into amateur radio is a good pastime. So um, on to today's topic, which is 802.11 arbitration. So what is it? So this is a standardized protocol that all APs and clients use to politely share the channel that they're operating on. And sometimes I'll call, uh, you'll, I'll use the word stations today. That's in the uh, 802.11 standard and it's just any Wi-Fi radio, an AP or a client. And this arbitration process is really, in my mind, the heart and soul of Wi-Fi. The, it, it's connected to all uh, my other knowledge about Wi-Fi, when we're doing design, what we're really doing most of the time is really trying to optimize the arbitration process as much as possible. And I think 802.11 arbitration is as important to Wi-Fi, um, to your knowledge of Wi-Fi as the OSI model is to thinking about networking in general. Uh, so it's a very important concept and uh, really excited to, to share some of this today. So on to the acronym soup and sales pitches. <clears throat> uh, no, so so why do we need uh, arbitration? Well, uh, Wi-Fi uses noisy unlicensed spectrum uh, and we don't use centralized scheduling uh, like cellular does um, for the most part. Um, and so uh, because moment to moment, the state of the channel we're operating on is is uh, uncertain. Maybe there's another Wi-Fi network um, or device uh, that we run aware of that starts transmitting. Maybe there's another wireless protocol in the same frequencies. Or maybe there's just uh, noise from a source of interference um, that's not a, a digital transmitter at all. That's the nature of unlicensed spectrum. It's sort of the wild, wild west. And the protocol has to account for that uncertainty. Cellular technologies don't have that um, hindrance. They're using licensed um, spectrum that they have exclusive access to, so they can centrally schedule um, access to the channel um, without uh, many issues and plan ahead what's going to happen, you know. Um, and and so the uh, the cellular tower can, you know instruct all the connected phones on who transmits when, who can transmit in what, you know, part of the spectrum uh, and and it and orchestrate access that way. Wi-Fi works the you know, completely opposite way. The AP does not tell clients when to transmit. Clients uh, and APs, of course, uh, have to make that decision on their own and they use the arbitration process to decide uh, if the channel is available or, or not. And, and uh, the reason we need to do this is the channel that our AP and clients are operating on is a half duplex medium. That means only one station can transmit at a time and that station can't hear itself. So it doesn't know if its transmission 
uh, was, um, you know, uh, encountered a collision with, with noise or, or another station transmitting at the same time. It's actually just, it's actually the same principle that walkie-talkies use. We set up all the all the walkie-talkie radios on the same channel, and one, only one person can talk at the same time. And while they're talking, they actually can't hear the channel at the same time. So we have to say, you know, over and out when we're done transmitting, and and uh, Roger or copy or something like that, um, you know, when the uh, to confirm that um, the receiving listener, you know, heard what you said. Wi-Fi has to do all the same things. So comparing that to Ethernet, which you know most network engineers are familiar with how Ethernet works. You know, Ethernet's a full duplex protocol, um, and it uses carrier sense multiple access with collision detection. Because it's full duplex, when an Ethernet adapter transmits out onto um, the you know Cat6 cable, uh, it is listening to itself on you know uh, some of those wires that are included in that. So it can hear if there was a collision or if its transmission you know was garbled or you know there was an error, it can do air checking on its own frames. We can't do that in Wi-Fi. Um, and uh, you know if you were around doing networking back in the 90s, you'll remember you know Ethernet uh, using a shared medium when we were using hubs and daisy chaining computers together and there was that little collision light that would turn red on the hub when, well, basically all the time <laughs> because it was uh, it was uh, just painful. And that's because we were all essentially using, you know, connected to the same cable and using uh, CMSA, CD, and Ethernet's um, uh, uh, access uh, protocol to share it. We don't do that anymore because of the advent um, and adoption of switching. Um, switching breaks up those collision domains. So there's only one computer connected to an ethernet cable and the switch uh, uh, intelligently manages traffic coming in from all the connected machines. They're all in their, a unique collision domain. And so we don't worry about um, those kind of issues anymore, which makes ethernet very, very efficient. Wi-Fi, you know, we're still um, stuck in that 90s model that Ethernet used to have. Uh, we're half duplex, just like a hub would be. And we're, um, you know, we're also, but um, we're also using uh, carrier sense multiple access with collision avoidance, right? Because we can't hear ourselves, we can only um, take steps to avoid collisions rather than confidently detecting them. Wi-Fi is half duplex, but Wi-Fi 7, which is what it, the 802.11b e uh, extremely high throughput um, uh, uh, generation of Wi-Fi, uh, may uh, start to introduce some full duplex features there. So stay tuned for that. But in Wi-Fi, to have uh, to to kind of um, break up the collision domains we put APs on separate channels. So all the clients and those, and, and those APs are in a unique collision domain. The channel is the collision domain, not the, not the AP. If our APs and uh, if our APs are all on the same channel, then they're all, uh, there's all that potential for collision between their associated clients um, and their own transmissions. Um, so important to use separate channels to to break up the collision domains. Um, and so um, a look at the five gigahertz spectrum. Um, uh, when we are using 20 megahertz channel widths, uh, we might, depending on where you are in the world, have access to 25 unique channels. And uh, you can think of each one of those as its own collision domain. And if they're far up, it, you know, the APs actually have to be quite a bit uh, spread out to reuse the same channel without causing contention. We'll get into some of that, why that is uh, later on. But as we start using wider channels, we have fewer available collision domains. And this is where that arbitration process, contention 
to when the channel occurs inside each of these collision domains. So although we can use wider channels and use higher data rates, um, we have fewer contention domains and uh, stations might, may have to wait longer to transmit. That's why in, in high density networks, we usually use smaller channel widths. So um, the, the formal protocol in 802.11 used for uh, arbitration uh, today is called EDCA, the Enhanced Distributed Coordination Access. And um, it's, uh, it's, it was defined in 802.11e. Um, it was enhanced to, uh, over DCF to add QoS queues. So we have uh, um, QoS playing a role in our arbitration process. And uh, it's still the same uh, uh, protocol we use uh, today in Wi-Fi, including Wi-Fi 6. And uh, the, the steps that we go through, you know, the a Wi-Fi station really tries very, very hard not to transmit if the channel is busy. And it goes through each of these steps and we'll go through each one. But the first one is the clear channel assessment. We look at layer one and layer two to see if there are, uh, uh, if there's uh, Wi-Fi or non-Wi-Fi uh, transmissions going on. Then we have the nav timer. This is a layer uh, layer two um, uh, feature where we read uh, the frame and figure out how much longer we need to back off. Then an inner frame spacing. That's just a that's just dead air. We're just adding a little extra buffer just to be sure. Uh, and during that that IFS, the clear channel assessment is still going on. Then we get to the contention window. That's what CW is. And if you think about it, if you've got multiple stations queued up ready to transmit, and they're all going through this process at the same time because another station just finished transmitting, they will get all the way to the contention window and be synchronized in their timing. So um, in order to keep them from just transmitting on top of one another, we have this contention window where uh, we introduce some randomness. Uh, where uh, a, a random uh, uh, backoff timer is used, and um, uh, and whoever's is the lowest gets to transmit. And throughout the whole contention window, the CCA process is going on. And finally, if all of that, all of those stages of EDCA are clear and the medium is idle, we finally transmit. And if it's not, we start all over. So uh, let's dig into each of these. So carrier sense CCA. So we're just listening now. Um, you'll sometimes see this called signal detect. That's what they um, sometimes call it in the standard. I like preamble detect because that's very literally what's going on. The stations are listening uh, for an 802.11 preamble that's in the phi header of a frame. And any time it can demodulate one, it will back back off. This is a very very sensitive threshold, and uh, the standard says you, you need to be able to uh, trip this threshold uh, with 4 dB of SNR. But 802.11 stations don't um, sense the noise floor uniformly. Noise is a really uh, uh, um, kind of un uh, uh, unreliable uh, measure that different clients make and they have very very different radio sensitivities and so this uh, this won't be a uniform thing for all your clients but they're listening for uh, the very first part of the transmission uh, from an 8 to 11 frame the fire layer where there's a length field that tells tells all the stations how long this frame is going to be so they can uh, wait for that period before uh, continuing on. And an important point about uh, carrier sense clear channel assessment is there's no consideration for the RSSI of the received frame. So if the frame, if the preamble is uh, demodulated and they use extremely low data rates, then a station will back off. Sometimes people think, oh, well, if I just turn my AP up louder than my neighbor's AP, 
then I'll win the channel more. I'll be louder than him. Like I, you know, if I turn my stereo up really loud, can't hear anything else besides my own music. That's not how Wi-Fi works. As long as we can demodulate the phi header of a frame, uh, station will back off, even if it's extremely quiet. Um, and so we'll get into some of the ramifications of that uh, later on. Um, the next phase, uh, clear channel assessment energy detect. This is where the station is just listening for any uh, non-Wi-Fi energy on the on the uh, channel. So it could be uh, uh, interference from a microwave or an analog transmitter, or it could be another wireless protocol like Bluetooth or Zigbee um, or anything else. Stations aren't uh, Wi-Fi stations are not very good at this, and the standard says the threshold for this is. 20 dB above the carrier sense threshold. So that could be up in the neg 70s or neg 60s in some cases, um, which would require you know that, that uh, energy source to be pretty loud uh, before this gets tripped. Um, and again, that challenge of uh, detecting noise is, is uh, a big one for Wi-Fi. Uh, the radios are just, uh, they use different methods with with really mixed results and we'll have you know wildly vary, varying noise measurements uh, even side by side on the same channels uh, but we're still just listening in this period and and then we're listening still when we're at the the nav timer uh, phase and this is if a frame has been transmitted and we can demodulate um, the the mac portion of the frame there is a duration field in that frame, and we can see that now in a packet capture. We can't see the preamble of a frame, but we can see layer two and above information there. And that duration field um, uh, actually is a little bit nicer than the length field in the preamble because it tells us the length of the, the frame being transmitted, but also the interframe spacing and the acknowledgement that's gonna come back from the receiver. So a little bit more precision, and we know exactly how long to back off from if we can get that. Um, and and uh, that is measured in uh, microseconds or millionth of a second. That's the unit of time we're using most, most often in uh, contention in Wi-Fi, millionths of a second. Then we get to the contention window, where we finally desynchronize everybody that's uh, waiting to transmit, and each station uses a random backoff timer, uh, starting with values uh, zero to 15, so 16 values, and and each of those slot times is nine microseconds. Um, so um, if a frame has to be retried because the receiver didn't transmit an acknowledgement in re uh, in response to the frame the contention window gets bigger for each retry. It doubles in size seven times until the frame is finally dropped and we have packet loss. Um, while that's happening, the data rate the station is using to transmit the frame is shifting down each time as well. So we start eating up airtime very, very quickly, uh, exponentially, um, as retries start to, to build up. And then QoS, this is where QoS for Wi-Fi comes into play. Um, QoS alters the size of that contention window. So for instance, if you're using the voice queue, um, you'll never uh, have to choose a value greater than seven, including on retries, because uh, that voice frame has to get out very quickly and we don't wanna just hang on to it for a long time. It's okay to have a little bit of packet loss if we can you know, keep latency at a minimum and jitter as well. Um, so once we finally start transmitting, um, uh, this is what, uh, this is how the, the process looks as, as frames begin transmitting. So everything we, we've talked about can be summarized there in that uh, contention uh, slot. Uh, that's, it's just dead air, but we're going through all these processes to politely share and, and, uh, and allow somebody to win the channel. Um, and then the first thing that gets transmitted from a frame is the FIA header, where the layer one information is, 
that's where the preamble is, which includes that length field for carrier sense CCA. Then the MAC header. This is all our normal layer two information. This is the duration, also includes the duration field for our nav timer, which which covers this entire uh, view of the data uh, data frame, IFS and ACK that follows af after it. Then we finally get to the MSDU, that's the uh, MAC service data unit. This is the actual data payload. So this is more than likely an IP packet that we're trying to get from one radio to the other. Everything else here is, is overhead just to deliver this IP packet. Uh, and then the last thing in the, Mac, uh, uh, in the Mac section of the frame is the frame check sequence for air correction. After the frame, we have a, a, some dead air with an inner frame space. Uh, and then an acknowledgement comes um, and uh, the ACK is just the receiver telling the transmitter, I got your frame and demodulated it correctly. If that ACK doesn't come through, the data frame gets retried with a longer contention window and a lower data rate. Um, so uh, one of the things I want to talk, and, and, and the importance about dividing up our collision domains is that uh, when we do that, it means that this process can occur in parallel on the different channels that we're using. If everybody's on the same channel, then this can only happen once. Doesn't matter how many APs are on the channel. This can only happen uh, once at a time. If our APs are on separate channels that aren't overlapping, this can happen in parallel on each channel. Um, and you know, I talked about the, the uh, inefficiency and the overhead required. Just to kind of uh, you know, bang that drum a little bit louder, um, you know, the contention um, period and the inner frame spacing is all dead air. The channel utilization is zero when this is occurring. Um, and further, um, you know, this, this might surprise you, but the phi header of a data frame um, is always transmitted at ancient, ancient legacy data rates. In 2.4 gigahertz, the phi header is always transmitted at either one or two megabits per second. Those are data rates that predate 802.11b. That's 802211 prime stuff. And in five gigahertz, the phi header is always transmitted at six megabits per second. You know, that's a, a data rate from 802.11a. And we do that so that these preambles can be demodulated at great distances, even if the rest of it um, can't. Um, and also because uh, the preamble um, using legacy data rates gives us backwards compatibility. So that if I have a, say an 802.11G station, and I don't speak 802.11N or 802.11AC, those data rates are noise to me, I can't demodulate them. I can still hear that preamble in the phi header and say, oh, here's a frame. I know the length field, I'll back off. Even though the rest of the frame is, is noise to me because I don't have support for those data rates, I can still participate in EDCA with, with, newer, um, with, with newer stations. Um, then um, we finally start using those high data rates. Uh, the layer two part of the frame is where um, the data rates that we configure on our APs and controllers actually come into play. And we'll transmit our data frame at the highest uh, rate we can achieve. Um, and then um, an ACK has no data payload. The ACK is just entirely overhead. And all of this is done for that, the MSDU. That's our data payload we're trying to deliver uh, from uh, a wireless station to another wireless station probably an IP packet destined for an ethernet network. Um, so a lot of overhead that's necessary, but it makes Wi-Fi inefficient. Um, and so everything we've talked about so far has been in a 20 megahertz um, situation. How do we handle 80 megahertz well, you know, wide channels where there might be some overlap uh, between uh, stations with wide channels and stations with 20 megahertz channels. And uh, how do we do that? Well, we kind of add to the uh, inefficiency in using the spectrum. And I'll kind of go through step by step how this works. 
uh, in 802.11ac with this example being 80 megahertz uh, uh, BSS. So we've got channel 36 as the primary and we're also using 40, 44, and 48 as secondary channels. So um, what we see, the first thing that, that happens is the transmitting station has to do a clear channel assessment on all four 20 megahertz subchannels, starting with the primary, then the secondary that would allow it to use 40, and then finally the other two uh, secondary channels to check and see if all 80 megahertz is available. And um, each of these has its own thresholds. And you'll note the carrier sense threshold um, goes from being, you know, almost hypersensitive, like we talked about in, uh, in the primary um, uh, channel. That's the same that we had have for a 20 megahertz uh, BSS. To in the secondary channels, it's minus 72 dBm. That's not very sensitive, right? There's plenty of Wi-Fi that, that could be going on below that. Um, we do that, then we transmit a request to send frame. This is a uh, control frame where we're just saying, I want to use the uh, channel for this long. And um, if I get a clear to send back from the receiver of the frame, I know it's available. Um, we do this to because there could be stations that we can't hear in our clear channel assessment, and we want to be uh, somewhat careful not to transmit on top of them. Then we wait for a interframe spacing and then the receiving station that's going to get this data frame that eventually is going to come goes through the same clear channel assessment process on each of the four 20 megahertz subchannels and responds with a clear to send on the channels that are available from its own clear, uh, clear channel assessment. In this case, it's saying, well, 36 and 40 are free, but 44 and 48 are not. My, something tripped uh, my clear channel assessment where I am. We wait an interframe spacing, and finally we transmit the data frame. What you'll note about the, about the data frame is the PHY header still just uses 20 megahertz uh, because it's using those legacy modulations for backwards compatibility uh, and robustness. It's only the layer two portion of the frame that uses the wide channel width. That's where our data payload again is. And then our response, our ACK, is just uses that 20 megahertz portion of, uh, of, the, um, of the wide channel. And then finally, contention resumes normally and starts all over again. But you know, we've just added another layer of inefficiency on top of this. And I think we've added, uh, you know, I think we're not using the spectrum. You'll you'll notice we're we're using the 20 megahertz channel for all the control and management traffic, um, and even part of the data frame getting transmitted. Those secondary channels are not getting used very much with uh, with wide channel widths. So, our, we're we're introducing spectrum inefficiency here. Whereas if we had four 20 megahertz channels, you know we could fill those all up with all the overhead that's required. Even though our data frames, uh, the the layer two part of our data frames, wouldn't be transmitted at at the same high data rates. Um, and and I'll also note that the you know the RTS that the transmitter uh, sent in channels 44 and 48 probably caused a collision, right? Because the receiver said, oh, actually those channels aren't available. So that that probably caused a collision that that may have resulted in retries in uh, whoever's operating in those channels. Okay, so moving on to, to, to kind of putting some of this all together and, and what it means for design. Keith Parsons has this uh, really great simplification of, of all this when it comes to design and channel planning. And he talks about these three areas, what you want, what you don't want, and what you don't care about. You know, no, we're done with acronyms for a while. So the area you want is where you've got good signal strength, right? What we're looking at here are two uh, APs operating on the same channel. Purple uh, AP on the left on channel one, green AP on the right on channel one, and they're overlapping. Uh, and the area we want is where that, from the purple AP's perspective, uh, it's got good signal strength, 
you know, minus 67 and above. And the transmissions from the green AP are below the noise floor. We're going to say the noise floor is minus 85 here. So it's not going to trip our clear channel assessments. And we don't have contention between the two uh, BSSs. The area we don't want is in the middle where our signal strength isn't great, but we can demodulate frames from both APs so and probably all their clients. So we've got contention between um, both sets of uh, from both BSSs. And then the area we don't care about from the purple APs perspective is where it's uh, transmissions drop below the noise floor and don't affect uh, arbitration anymore. So you may have heard of ghost frames. Uh, this is this is where we this is the those um, those kind of frames where this is a, well first of all this is a completely normal part of Wi-Fi. It's happened forever, but these are frames that you can't see in a packet capture, but they still cause um, clear channel assessment um, carrier sense to trip. These are frames where um, perhaps you're too distant from the transmitter to decode the MAC portion of the frame because it uses a very high data rate, but the preamble you can still decode. And as long as you can do that, that'll trip carrier sense, clear uh, CCA, and you'll back off. But if you're looking at a packet capture, those frames are invisible. So they're like spooky ghost frames. Again, perfectly normal part of Wi-Fi, but I think it's an important concept to understand. So what does this look like in a survey? Um, um, well, for one, it means that there's this huge contention area that's often bigger than the sort of coverage area of an AP. So here's an AP on channel 36, I'm using 20 megahertz in a typical um, office layout. And the yellow and green areas are where we have good signal strength. The gray area is the contention area where we don't have good signal strength and we don't want clients to connect to it. But the, the um, signal from the AP is still loud enough to trip that carrier sense um, threshold because the preambles are so robust and require so little SNR to demodulate. So what happens if we turn on another AP on channel 36, even at the opposite end of the building? Well, now we've get, we get this big don't want area because those preambles can go just about forever, it seems like. And we get overlapping BSS contention. OBSS is a term used in uh, the standard quite frequently, and it's talking about co-channel interference. It's really contention. Right, we hear the preamble, we back off. It's probably not collisions; it's contention, but uh, popularly known as co-channel interference um, or OBSS. So that's bad news. And these APs are a couple hundred feet away, um, and and part of the reason uh, their RF is spreading out so far is these APs are in the hallways. You'll notice that the, a the AP at the bottom is just shooting RF you know, up and down the uh, hallway it's in, and the same for the AP at the top. And signal strengths actually in the rooms aren't very good. So with proper design, we can fix that. We can get better signal strength in the room by putting the APs in rooms. And now the, you know, the yellow and green areas where we want clients, where clients will have the best uh, connections are where they are actively using the Wi-Fi in the rooms. But we're also, uh, limiting the size of those contention areas and and we don't have a don't want area anymore here anymore um, so again it's with when we're doing design it's easy to make this whole floor look yellow and green and provide you know proper coverage everywhere it's much more difficult to optimize arbitration by uh, limiting um, co-channel interference or eliminating it if possible. So some design considerations from some of the things we've talked about. Uh, break up the contention domains to avoid co-channel interference or overlapping BSSs. Um, more contention domains, um, even with smaller channel widths, 
means more net capacity. The system is more efficient overall. Um, and smaller channel widths gives us more contention domains. And for, for uh, because of the range of preambles, code channel interference is a mu much larger problem than it appears to be. There are those ghost frames that are just showing up out there, here and there, and you won't see them in a packet capture, but they're there. And, um, and one last thought, if you've followed me so far, the, the last kind of step in understanding this concept is we just looked at AP um, contention areas and coverage, but APs, of course, have associated clients that are transmitting out as well, and some of those clients are out at the edge of the cell, right? And if our cells are uh, fairly near nearby, the client transmissions at the edges of each cell will trip uh, the CCA thresholds uh, for each other. So client induce co-channel interference um, actually makes this an even tougher problem uh, to solve. So I'll just leave that there. And we've, uh, I mentioned Wi-Fi 6 a couple times. Um, OFDMA uh, has the potential for um, altering uh, or enhancing a little bit about, uh, a little bit of, of what we've talked about. Now it's not a switch, uh, even though the, the marketing and sales guys sometimes call it like call it that it's or switch like it's more like an air traffic controller so we can take the channel and divide it into um, smaller resource units and intelligently orchestrate who's transmitting and receiving in those smaller subdivisions in the channel um, centrally the AP can do that that's scheduled access just like cellular does uh, okay so that is the the goal of OFDMA, it'll allow multiple stations to transmit and receive at the same time. But there's a big uh, there's there's a big challenge to this. We're still using unlicensed spectrum, so we can't schedule out too far. And for this to happen, the AP has to first win channel access through the same EDCA process that that we've always used. And once the AP wins the channel, then it can schedule OFDMA. So in five gigahertz, uh, where you've got um, pre-Wi-Fi 6 clients, legacy clients, now you've got a situation where uh, you'd like OFDMA to occur, but the AP is contending along with all your other uh, clients uh, for the channel before it can even think about scheduling anything. Um, so keep an eye on that. There's been a lot of challenges uh, with getting OFDMA working in, in labs. Um, and, uh, you know, on workbenches, and we'll kind of see as, as progress uh, continues there. And then another big feature that affects this in Wi-Fi 6, which hasn't been implemented yet, to my knowledge, is a feature called spatial reuse. We finally recognize that the clear channel assessment carrier sense threshold is too sensitive to overlapping BSS or CCI um, transmissions. And, and so what spatial reuse does is allow us to have a separate CCA carrier sense threshold for OBSS transmissions and have a separate nav timer for those as well. So we're, we don't have to be as sensitive to those, you know, really quiet neighbors that would otherwise trip our CCA thresholds. Okay. I think uh, I got through all the important bits. And uh, Don, do we have a few minutes uh, uh, for questions uh, left? Yeah, so you, actually great timing. So you finished up right on time uh, at 11.45 here local time. So um, we've got enough time for probably, I don't know, two or three questions if, if you've got the bandwidth. Um, and while folks are uh, pulling their questions together, uh, I got a lot of great comments, um, Jim, about your presentation today. Not that we don't always, but uh, you might want to save this chat to your personal pride wall uh, PR today for uh, for um, comments. So great presentation, Thanks. a lot of Appreciate requests that. for the slides. Um, so for, for folks that are asking for the slides, um, we'll certainly uh, PDF uh, these slides and 
and get them up. We do share those on Twitter. Um, if you're not a Twitter user, you can simply email me and we'll get you a copy of those slides. No problem. And then, of course, the recording will always be posted up on on YouTube. Um, I am searching through the comments here, looking for questions here, Jim. If you wanna, if you see any, go ahead and and jump on them. But uh... yeah. Um, so a question from Chris. Uh, he says the standard doesn't define the preamble detect at 4 dB SNR. This just happens to be the SNR needed to typically properly decode a preamble. And uh, what's interesting is. So there are different CCA thresholds for different generations of Wi-Fi specified there in the threshold uh, in the um, in the standard, uh, and it does say that it should be at least 4 dB. So it's not a it's you're right it's not a hard and fast rule. Thanks for the question, Chris. I want to hear from Alan. Um, and I guess there's a lot of ways to to answer this one, but do you see issues getting worse with teleworking? Yeah, I do because you know your AP and your neighbor's AP, and particularly in in denser residential areas, are totally uncoordinated. There's no central designer that can um, put everybody on a unique channel and intelligently reuse those channels. It's often just kind of a mess with a lot of uh, with CCI being kind of through the roof. Um, so it, it is a, a bigger problem for teleworking, I think. Uh, let's see. Thanks for the question, Alan. Thanks, Jim, for the response. Next question from Chris here. Uh, what is typically the decision point for uh, to use wider channels like 40 versus smaller 20-wide channels? Or, uh, yeah, me, diff like there different perspectives on that um some engineers say start with 20 until you have a use case for 40. you need x you know those those higher throughput uh data rates for a specific application that requires them um and then another perspective is well if the if you've got enough spectrum and um and and you can use 40 megahertz channels without increasing code channel interference you know, your APs can be spread out far enough, go ahead and use it. Um, I think for me, I, I'm kind of in that second camp. If the spectrum's clear, if if those, uh, you know, if the uh, signal from, from other APs on the channel you want to use are, are below the noise floor, um, then go ahead and use, use 40. All right. Uh... Comment here from Mike. I'll take this as a compliment. Uh, great slides today. Not much marketing fluff. <laughs> Thanks yeah. a lot, Mike. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Uh, so a follow-up question from Alan here. He's got, uh, Mike says he tries. Uh, uh, follow-up here from Alan. He says, is this an issue uh, using VPN teleworking? Uh, you know, it's it's really just an issue, an RF issue. Uh, between uh, you know the, the the client radios and the AP radios, uh, so uh, VPN um, uh, is is a secondary consideration. All right, um, so we're a little bit over. I'm going to shut it down there. If you, uh, I'll get to the rest of the questions with Jim um, after the presentation, we'll do those in writing. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, great job, Jim. Um, we'll see you all next week. Have a, a great rest of the week. Thanks, everybody.